Hey guys and welcome back, this is Bimsy Codes, and in today's lesson we're going to be going over the final polish for our game. At the moment our game scene is looking pretty bland, all we've got is our little character, the grass and the sky which are just two flat colours. So to fix this I'm going to go over to the asset store and find some asset packs to start populating into our game. So I've already gone ahead and found a few asset packs that I like and the links for those will be in the description below. Um, so if I just go to my package manager now I'm going to install these. The asset packs that I've found are the Fantasy Skybox Free, the RPG Polypack Light, and the Use Free Ground Materials. So I'm going to go ahead, download, and import these into my game right now. So with all of those asset packs imported, you'll notice we've now got a few more folders in our assets directory here. So what I'm going to do is just drag these extra folders into my external folder so that we've got all of our external asset packs sort of organized in one directory. So there's the ground textures pack as well. And finally, we've got the RPG assets pack. Great. Now with that out of the way, we can start doing a few of the smaller things to polish in our game. So one of the, one of the things I want to address first is this camera. With the character added, I sort of just want to move the main camera down a little bit so that we've got a bit more view of the actual bottom of the screen. So I'm going to maybe make this value 8.5 on the Y. And as you can see straight away, we've got a little bit more of that grass being displayed. Let's just try 8 for a second. Um, I actually think 8 looks pretty good, so I'm going to leave it at that. So the next thing I'm going to do is give our grass a texture. So as you can see, we've got our externals folder here, and we've got all of the grass textures that we just downloaded in here. So if we take a look into the folders, we can actually use our arrow keys to navigate between these folders. And... Um, I'm going to find a grass texture that I th think will look good. So this grass 05 looks pretty good. So I'm just going to grab the texture and drag it onto the, the plane for this ground. And then if we actually go into our materials element over here, we can increase the tiling of that texture so that it loops across this ground a few more times. So essentially we're duplicating this texture now 10 times across the X and across the Y. And I think that's looking pretty good. We can sort of experiment with the tiling a bit more if we want the grass to appear smaller. So 15 by 15. I think I like 10 actually. So I'm gonna keep it at 10 there. And uh, yeah, so the next step we're gonna wanna do is get a, a sky to match. So it's pretty easy to set up the sky. Um, all we wanna do is go to our main camera, and we wanna make sure that we've got this sky box enabled over here. So we've got our clear flag sky, uh, sky box. And as you saw in a previous tutorial, we can actually set the color of our sky over here. But we wanna actually be setting this sky to an image. So if we take a look at our asset packs for fantasy sky box over here, we can see that we've got a bunch of different sky box materials. Um, so all of these presets we can apply to the background of our game. So this will actually give us a few cool effects. So we'll want to jump into window. Um, we want to open up the lighting window. So where is that one? Rendering, lighting. And I'm just going to drag this one over here next to my inspector. And if we go into uh, the environment tab in our lighting window, we can select the skybox material. So we've got all of our skybox material presets. Um, and as you can see here, those have come straight in from the asset pack. So if we select this guy, you'll actually notice in our game scene that skybox sort of updates. Now I'm gonna go for something that matches my green grass a little bit better. Um, I think the blue sky looks pretty good. I actually like that brown as well because it matches the green grass. Um, Ooh, that looks quite nice as well, doesn't it? Um, I think I might go for this blue sky, though. Yeah, I'll go for that blue sky. That looks pretty uh, standard. I'm noticing straight away that our game is looking way better. However, I do sort of feel like the game scene is looking a bit bright. So we're going to go to our directional light, and we're going to reduce this intensity to about 0 0.8. Um, that's looking a little bit better so we can actually see a little bit of the detail on our character a bit better there. And I'm also going to change my lighting to a bit of a bright yellow. So this lighting parameter sort of affects how we're illuminating the game in this scene. Um, 
So we can actually set this to multiple different colors. Like we can apply shades of red and this is sort of good to set the mood of your game, but I'm gonna keep it a light yellow because I wanna sort of have a positive atmosphere in our game. So I think that's looking pretty good. And what we can actually do is also add shadows to our game because we can see on the lighting here, we're projecting no shadows. So I'm gonna actually add soft shadows um, and you'll notice straight away that we've got this shadow now projecting on the plane. With shadows having been implemented in the game, it's actually obvious to me now that the player is not actually standing on the ground. So what I'm gonna do is select my ground game object in the hierarchy, and I'm going to re reduce this one to about, so let's take a look over here. So if it's zero, it's sort of intersecting the player's chest. So let's try two, so that's gonna bring it higher. Let's try negative two. And I believe negative two is exactly where that player is standing. So if we take a look at the player, his rigid body is connected to the ground now, and that might actually create some, some strange interactions with our physics system. Because if you remember, we've actually got some drag components attached to the player. So I'm gonna go ahead and reduce this drag. Um, and I'm also going to constrain the player's rotation along all of his axes. Because when the player moves left or right, we don't actually want him rotating at all. And now that he's connected to another a uh, rigid body and collider being the ground that might uh, have some strange interactions happen when we play the game. So before we test our game, I'm actually noticing there's a small shadow in the background here, and that's actually our droppable spawner game object. So if you remember, we've got this mesh renderer attached to this, and because it's off the camera, we don't actually see it when we play the game. But now that we've got shadows enabled, there is a small trace of it down there. So we can either stop its projection of shadows in its mesh renderer here, if we go to the lighting tab, we can cast shadows and select off, and straight away you'll notice the shadow disappears. Or we can remove the mesh renderer and disable it. We can either disable the mesh renderer or remove the component completely to stop all rendering. I sort of like that we can visualize where the spawner is, so I'm just going to en enable it here so we can see it in our game scene. And now we've sort of removed all evidence in the game itself. So let's go ahead and test our game, make sure the player still interacts properly. So you'll notice because we've removed that drag element, his speed is going up like crazy. So we want to sort of mess around with the properties in, um, in a second, and we'll sort of figure out what works for the player's speed and his acceleration. Um, but I feel like it's still working as intended. And as the objects drop down into the game scene now, you will actually see the shadows falling down. So we can sort of predict where the objects are gonna land based on that. So I think that's pretty cool. So to get the character controller working as intended, I'm actually going to introduce some new functionality and introduce a new variable to control the acceleration and max speed. So let's jump into the code. So in our character controller class, I'm gonna first rename this move speed to acceleration. And then I'm also gonna introduce a new variable called max speed. Now the acceleration should uh, work as before. So that should be fine right here. Um, and I'm going to just set the default values. So my acceleration I'm going to set to 30 and I might set this one up as 15. The max speed, uh, I'm not too sure. We'll have to test those once we get this implemented in the game. Now the next thing I want to do is separate this rigid body and create a, a variable so we don't need to call this as much. So I'm going to create a rigid body variable, call it rigid body equals get component rigid body. And then we're gonna add the force here. And finally, we wanna check if the player's current speed is faster than the max speed. If it is, we want to set the player's current speed so it's equivalent to this max speed. So to do this, we're going to call, um, it's higher than or equal to max speed. So this is gonna be on the right-hand side of the operator. And what we need to fill out here on the left-hand side is we need to find a way to grab the rigid body's current velocity. So to do this, we're gonna to wanna to grab velocity and not normalized, but magnitude. Magnitude returns a vector or returns a float based on a vector three. So this velocity here will return a vector three, but we wanna convert it to a float so that we can compare it to this max speed variable. 
And now it is possible that this magnitude could be negative. So what we also want to add here is a math float dot absolute. That way, if we're traveling towards the left hand side of the screen, we're converting that negative number to a positive number. And this should be everything we need in our if statement for the code to work. So if this is true, our player is moving faster than intended, and we're going to want to set his max speed up in the rigid body. So let's go rigid body dot velocity. And you'll notice here the velocity has a getter and a setter. So to set the velocity, we need to be returning a vector three on the right hand side of the expression. So what I'm going to do is again, I'm going to grab rigid body. And this time we're going to use the velocity dot normalized to grab the vector, th the vector three's direction, but in a length of one. So this will just give us a directional vector and we want to multiply this by the max speed. And jumping back into our code, this should work perfectly for us. So if we run the game, we should see the player's interaction having some acceleration to his character and then a max speed as well. Now I think the acceleration is a bit fast because it sort of looks a bit awkward based on the player's max speed. I think the max speed fits quite well in terms of the animation because it sort of matches up with the player's uh, running animation a bit better. Now a better implementation for the animation would be to actually coordinate that with the velocity that the player is traveling in as opposed to the input that the player is giving. So we might get to that in our next step. But for now, I'm actually going to reduce the player's acceleration. So if we find our acceleration and max speed, so I'm going to make my max speed 15 and my acceleration 25. Now let's try this one out. You'll notice if I release the keyboard, he sort of jumps into his idle stance, even though he's still moving. So to fix this, we'll want to jump back into the code and fix how we send our uh, horizontal input to the animator controller. So back in the character controller class, we're going to want to pass through the rigid body's current velocity along the X axis to the horizontal uh, component of the animator controller that we have on our player. So instead of passing this horizontal input, we're going to grab rigid body dot velocity and we're going to pass in X. And now if we go back to our game, and the reason this is X is because that's the uh, axes that our player moves along. Um, if we go back into our game and we want to test this one out, just going to let it compile. We should see when I release the keyboard, the character keeps running until he stops. So if I press the keyboard really quickly, he'll keep running and then he'll stop eventually and he'll go back to his idle stance. He'll run and then he'll stop and he'll go back to his idle stance. He'll run and he'll stop and he'll go back to his idle stance. All right, I think that's looking pretty good. All right, guys, that's going to wrap up part one of the polishing of our game. Um, so in the next lesson, we'll do part two and we'll cover the rest of the things we need to do to complete our game. I'll see you then.